Velkommen til tre runder med Big George Foreman, der vi skal snakke om hans boksekarriere og hans liv for øvrig. Welcome uh, to Big George Foreman, also the preacher George Foreman. It's nice to hear, have you here in Scandinavia. And um, of course, you have become even bigger than you used to be by becoming the heavyweight champion 5th of November 1994 in Las Vegas. That was, of course, a um, great moment, the moment you were dreaming for. And um, did you ever believe that you was going to be possible to do that? Uh, although you believe and you train hard, you have a lot of faith. But when it happens, it blows your mind. It's more than I could expect. I mean, I had to get on my knees because it was a miracle. Exactly. And, and um, immediately the fight was over, you dropped down to your knees and prayed the prayer. You didn't even raise your arms. You just <laughs> dropped down and thanked God, I believe. That's right, because... You, you train hard and you practice, you try to perfect jabs, left hooks, right hands, but then when they start working that, perf that perfectly for you, and, then, uh, and I got a knockout, I didn't win by decision. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a miracle, I had to really make sure I let everybody know where all the blessings were coming mm -hmm. from. Because it's easy in a moment like that, when you have total success in, in sports, it's easy to forget God. That's right, and I, a lot of my strength has come by way of prayers, and, I've had to sacrifice a lot. I've worked extremely hard, but, mm -hmm. but most of that I, I prayed because I didn't get any injuries mm -hmm. prior to the boxing match. I was able to get two chances to fight for that particular title. That's a miracle right there. You also pray for your opponent. That's true. You want to make sure that because, you know, the God, God is the God of the whole world, mm -hmm. and you hate to think, hey, his blessings are exclusive to George Foreman. Mm -hmm. So when I get on my knees, I think as a preacher, too, to make sure that nobody get injured. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a great sporting event for the fans. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of praying going on. <laughs> <laughs> when you have lost a few fights and uh, title fights after you come back, uh, do you ask God why? You know, a lot of times you train hard and you do your best. Mm -hmm. If I give 100%, I feel like I'm a winner. Mm -hmm. There's a time or two I got into the ring, uh, probably back in the 70s, where I didn't give everything. Mm -hmm. I never was satisfied. Then I had to ask God, but as long as I gave 100%, I knew my prayers were answered. The oldest one to be a challenger for the heavyweight title before you were your trainer, former trainer, Archie Moore. What happened to him? I mean, he was the trainer all the way as a professional until a few years ago. Yeah, Archie has taken sick, as mm -hmm. you know. Recently, mm -hmm. he had triple bypass surgery on mm -hmm. his heart, but he's doing fine now. Mm -hmm. A lot of things that I've been able to do and execute in the ring has been because of Archie's training. Archie helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had you learned your double guard by yeah, Archie. And that's uh, right, I was able to use the cover-up, but when I fought uh, uh, Moore, Michael Moore, I didn't use the cover-up at all. I had to go straight up and down, which was mm -hmm. difficult, mm -hmm. but it paid off. Mm -hmm. Before the fight, I was there, and you had the press conference, and uh, did you try to scare Moore? I mean, you, you talked about uh, almost killing things. I mean, Bad things. I've, I've got a little bit scared myself. Did you try to scare him? Or? <laughs> Not at all, but you, you make everybody aware because mm -hmm. a lot of times boxers have gotten into the ring with the preacher mm -hmm. and they think, oh, he's not going to knock me out. If I can go a few rounds, he's not going to hurt me. Mm -hmm. And I let him know this time that I had permission to go out and get a knockout, mm -hmm. but never to hurt, never a shot in anger, never a punch in anger. Mm -hmm. This time it was more important than ever for you. I, you called Bob Barron and asked, give me this fight. I mean, you hadn't fought for almost one half year after yeah. last Tom Morrison, and he did whatever to get that fight, and he did. And uh, why did he feel so comfortable about winning this fight? Well, it was an odd thing because uh, Bob Arum said, you think you can whip Michael Moore? I said, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, you want me to put it together? I said, it would be the greatest moment in my life. And he was able to put that boxing match together. I knew it would be my last chance. If I missed this chance, it wouldn't be any, anything about making excuses. So it was important that I not only get the fight, but win it. And not only win it, but win it by knockout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you said after the fight that um, if you didn't win it, win it by knockout, you would lose by point you thought. And you were far behind on points, at least on my card. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but you also said that you were glad that they had picked up the, uh, the three-time three -down knockdown rule so that... Uh, uh, you no. had to knock him out. Yeah, back. it was really sad. I intended to knock him down three right, times right. and win the thing. Mm -hmm. But they came to my dressing room prior mm -hmm. to the boxing match and told me they were going to waive the three knockdown rule, mm -hmm. which meant 
even if I knocked him down three right. times in one round, mm -hmm. I could lose because he get up, mm -hmm. he's going to run from me. And if he runs from me for 12 rounds, no matter what, they're going to give him the, the, the decision. So I realize if I get him into the ring, I'm going to make him soft, make him soft. Every round, make him soft and then go for the knockout later on and he'll stay down. He certainly did. And that's what I planned. Mm -hmm. Ok, vi skal uh, ta en titt på uh, den 10. runde i uh, denne kampen mot Michael Moore, 15. november i Las Vegas. Let's watch, uh, George, uh, the fight here is uh, before the 10th round in uh, Las Vegas. And you have uh, Andrew Dundee there. And um, what did they say before the 10th round? Well, they're talking a lot because I didn't let on my strategy to them. And I'm kind of, I've got them kind of confused. Uh, they're wondering why am I waiting around, but if I had told them what I was going to do, they would have probably discouraged me. So Angelo Dundee is telling me, you better get a knockdown now. I told him, be quiet because they may hear him and go around to the other corner and tell them what I'm saying. Are you tired at this time? Not at all. I train for long fights. As a matter of fact, as the fight go on, I get stronger. You can see I can't even wait to, to get started. I walk back and forward in the corner. I get bored. You stand up always in the corner. Yeah, but I'm so heavy, if I sit down, I can't get up. <laughs> <laughs> now I think Moore started to get uh, confused. He was hitting you with a lot of punches, but he was not able to do anything more than that. Yeah. Well, what I'm having to be confused, I don't want to make him move away from me too much, because if he starts thinking, hey, George is powerful and backs up, he could survive the ring. So I make him stay in front of me as much as I can throwing punches. When I hit him, he hits me back, which is the major mistake. He should have allowed me to hit him and move out of the way. Then come in with the rushes and move away again? Yes, but he was he tried to pin me back every time. <laughs> he fell into the spider web. And he was working against his corner too. Uh, yeah, because but but I got him going, as you know, I moved right into his power, which is difficult, and then I come back with a hook. Everything started happening by way of the Right hand, left hook. Uh, did the soft pole style suit you good? I think so. I think that it was awful bad. Uh, boxing goes in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. And if you don't use it right, then you can find yourself in the worst trouble than uh, the left hand. I don't think anybody should fight soft pole unless they absolutely have to do it. <laughs> T tell us about your thoughts now, George. Well, right now, I got him soft. I've landed that hook. Then I missed the left hook because I was able to get it. There he is. But he's hurt now. It's a matter of me now going back to the right and forgetting about the left hook. How's Teddy Atlas? Now I got him going because I'm going to hit him with a good right hand right now that sets him up. That's the right First hand one. that really hurts. That's the one that hurts. I already landed. Now it's a matter of. Now I hit him on the tip of his face with that left hook. There. That's right. it. Did you feel it? That, that was it? No, it was the prior, the, the right hand that I threw before that one that really gave him the, the hurt. Mm -hmm. the, the last one was just a finishing punch. Then 10 and out, and you became the oldest heavyweight champion in the world. And here, you're taking the prayer and thanking. Yeah, it's about telling God I really mm -hmm. appreciate living this long, number one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and to be alive and to set a goal for myself. I started this, I was old, about 36 years old when I started trying to recapture the title. Mm -hmm. And everybody was telling me, no way. Mm -hmm. I got still one year to do comeback. I'm just <laughs> 35. Oh, you're a kid. You're still <laughs> wet behind the ear. <laughs> okay. It's, um, um, I want to talk more about uh, you know, how important God is to me because you used to be, look like a mean fellow 20 years ago. Yeah, I had no direction. I was brought up in the mean streets of Fifth Ward, mm -hmm. all of my ro uh, role models were muggers, people who would rob people and mm -hmm. steal. And I, uh, I heard the, the call earlier for the Job Corps, and that kind of got me on the right road a little bit, but I still had this mean streak in mm -hmm. me, and I think meeting God was the thing that really straightened me out. What gave you this mean streak? Uh, you, you brought up and uh, all your role models are tough people, mean people. Mm -hmm. And you, f you find yourself patterning yourself after people who, who are basically cruel people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I never did get this out of my blood, really. You were uh, number five out of seven children. Yeah, my mother, we had, she had seven children. 
JD was your father and That's Nancy. Yes. And um, was how was your childhood? I mean, well, it was a nice. You come from a family. childhood where really my mother and father broke up early, mm -hmm. and so it was a matriarchal family. My mother ruled the house, but she couldn't really watch over me properly. You need a father at home to really steer boys in the right direction. And so I got out of hand, got on the wrong road, and we were extremely poor, always needing something, always needing something to eat, mm -hmm. uh, always looking for another house to live, to move in, to stay in. So you really can't pick up a lot of values like that. Mm -hmm. So your mother has to, had to come become a hard worker. I mean, it That's was true. tough to bring up seven children. Yeah, the mother has to be the mother and father. Yeah. And I, w I gave her a lot of trouble. <laughs> you did? Yes. <laughs> you regret that now? Yeah, yeah. Well, my mother's still alive. I've been able to make it up. That's good. But uh, I regret that I was probably the cause of a lot of her headaches. Yeah. Okay. Um, breaking up uh, your family with your, um, your mother and father, being that into the today, of course, then you think that it's important to have a mother and a father in the family. That's right. I think that uh, any time uh, a man has kids, he got to make sure he stay real close and don't leave it to the mothers to raise the kids. Because even though they look like they're growing up fat and healthy, a lot of times there's a lot of, a lot of things missing without a father. So what is then your mission to the family and the world in that case? Well, well my brother Roy and me started the George Foreman Youth Center back mm -hmm. in 1984. We started helping kids. And what we try to do is be there for them, mm -hmm. not to preach to them, not about religion, just be there for them to let them know that everybody is not out there stealing. And uh, if they need a pair of shoes sometime, they've got George. They need an extra clothes, they've got George. But the main thing is to let them know that someone cares about them. And that's a major mission right now. Mm. Do you feel that this is probably the most important mission for you on this earth? No doubt about it. Uh, you pass through this world and uh, you get a lot of good things happen to you, but there are a lot of people who have a lot of misfortune. You want to let them know that they are equally as important as George for me. Mm. Equal equally as important. There's yeah. no big George and little George. Everybody's okay. That's good to hear. And you got to make sure you paint that picture. Yeah. Uh, you quit school uh, when you were 14 years old and too early <laughs> and then went into for two years doing nothing. Was that a yeah. very problem for in your life? Yeah, d when you drop out of school you really don't have anything to do. I would make truants by not by finding other things to do during the day, gambling, drinking, smoking, and just being a terrible kid. And it wasn't until 1965, I think, I joined the Job Corps that I got a second chance to get my life on track. Yeah, you went to Rhino Conservation Center. Yeah, it was uh, in uh, Grants Pass, Oregon, mm -hmm. all the way from Texas to Grants Pass, Oregon. A splendid trip for me. That's where I learned uh, carpentry work. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I went into another center in California, Parks Job Corps Center, where I learned to be a an electronic assembler mm. and good math and English and I got a general education diploma. I was on my way then. Oh, good. When did you meet uh, this uh, boxing trainer, Nick Doc Brothers? Yeah, Doc Brothers was the boxing coach at, in California right. when I went into the Pleasanton, California. And I went out, I told everybody, I was listening to Muhammad Ali fight Floyd Patterson on the radio station. Right. He was still being called Cassius Clay then. And uh, I was a bully in Oregon, and everybody looked at me and said, you picking, you're always fighting, why don't you become a boxer? Mm -hmm. I said, okay. I was 16 years old, I'll be a boxer. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the boxing coach, I said, hey, I want to be a boxer. He told me, you're big enough and you're ugly enough, come on. <laughs> that was my uh, introduction to Doc Brothers. He did, I mean, many, of, many fighters, many athletes have persons that are the guidelines for, for the be beginning of their career. Mike Tyson had, had uh, cursed a matter. That's true. Uh, was this uh, Doc Brothers some kind of in that direction for you? Yeah, Doc Brothers convinced me that uh, my future was in the ring and if I'd stop fighting in the alleys and, and stop getting into trouble, that I could become an Olympic gold medalist. He kept trying to put that into me. Finally, in 1968, under his wings, mm -hmm. he kept telling me to be a boxer. He wouldn't give up on me. I won a gold medal in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, look at that uh, fight with um, uh, Russian in the final in Mexico, yeah. 1968. Foreman in the white shirt, Shapoulos of the Soviet Union in the red shirt. We've got 50 seconds left in the second round. Soviet fighter is moving away. He is holding on. 
Nagy appears to this reporter to have had enough. But the fight goes on. Hammer tight for Ghana has not. That's it. That's it. Referee stops contest. Well, George, here you become the Olympic champion and you waved the American flag, very, very proud of what you've done. Was that something you did uh, intentionally, wave the American flag? Proud of being an American, you said. Yeah, what happened is uh, I didn't get a chance to get a great college education, mm -hmm. I, nor did I have any form of wealth or something to allow me to get a scholarship. I was truly rescued by, from the gutter mm -hmm. when Lyndon Johnson, the great president, started the uh, anti-poverty program. It gave me a chance to learn a vocation, to even start uh, get an application to be into the Olympics. So when I won that gold medal, I wanted to make sure everybody knew where I was from. I, I started to bow to the judges and wave my flag to make sure they knew I was an American. I was so proud of that. But this was mid, in the middle of, uh, of the black power thing in, in um, America. And we had in the same Olympics, Tommy Smith and John Carlos who up with their hands and said black power. Did you receive any problems when you got back from the Olympics with the racism that you didn't go with them and things like that? A lot of people didn't like what I did. Mm -hmm. At that time, being patriotic, not only in America, but anywhere in the world, was not fashionable. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody was anti-social. Mm -hmm. So here I am, waving a small flag, which people were wearing on the back of their pants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they didn't like it. They were burning their draft cards. And they hear you, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. How could you do that when all the brothers are doing this, that, and the other? So I had to, uh, uh, I became the butt of a lot of uh, hard, hardness, but I didn't mind. Mm -hmm. I, was, I had won that Olympic gold medal and I was proud. And it's the only thing I did at 19, mm -hmm. that if I had a chance to do again, I would do it again. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, there was, uh, like I said, a lot of racism problem in America. And um, did you uh, experience any other problem than that? I mean, I had a trainer in, in Chicago, uh, Johnny Brown, who was a Baptist priest when I lived there in 1980, and we sat down sometimes and talked about his future, I mean, the past, and he told me that he grew up in Chicago, you know, West Side, and he fell in love with a white girl at that time, if you can imagine, in Chicago, and he sat down in his garage sometime, and he was talking to me, we became very good close friends, and he was crying about the problems he had with racism at that time. Did you have experienced anything like that? Well, I'm a product of a compassionate society. Mm -hmm. I am proof that America doesn't get up, give up on its underprivileged. Mm -hmm. I was rescued from the gutter and given an extra chance, and by way of that, got a great education, traveled all over the world. Mm -hmm. Here I am right here in mm -hmm. Sweden, mm -hmm. all because of a government that doesn't give up on its underprivileged, mm -hmm. and because of a lot of volunteers like Doc Brodus, mm -hmm. who gave me their blood, sweat, and tears to make out of me what I've become. So. What I always try to do is accentuate the positive, mm -hmm. eliminate the negative, right. and even do away with Mr. In-Between because I've had a good life. Here I am, uh, I need to have a little <laughs> less life. <laughs> life has been really good to me, and all I know about home is that I love it. Just like you, you can't wait to get back home. Right. That's the only thing I can say about the country is that, I, you know, I love traveling, but I love home. Mm -hmm. George, we're going to talk more about uh, yourself, your career as a fighter and you as a person, but could you please announce our first break? Sure. Hey, we'll be right back. We're going to take a break and you better be here when we get back. Missa inte årets största gala där hela fem VM-matcher ska avgöras. 46-åriga Larry Holmes möter nykomlingen Oliver McCall om en plats tillbaka på tronen. And I'm going back to the top to be that champion once again. Vem tar över bältet efter George Foreman? Tony Tucker möter Bruce Seldon. Två tungviksmästare ska krönas. Knockout Live ikväll 02.30. Ända... Vi kommer tillbaka till uh, denna samtal. Vi ser andra runda med George Foreman som är här på besök i Skandinavia. Well, George, uh, let's um, talk about you as a priest. You are a preacher man, and um, what kind of what kind of preacher are you? Well, I'm I'm, an, I'm actually an evangelist. And I, I'm with the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ in Houston, Texas, but I've traveled all over the world giving my testimony. I had an experience in '77 after fighting Jimmy Young. 
which really scared me to death. In a split second, I had this vision. I was dead and alive again. And I saw over my head nothing but nothing. And it scared me, so I started to tell this story from 77, and people started calling me brother, mm -hmm. then Reverend. I was ordained in 60, 78. Then I went on to preach in prisons, and I travel all over the world to this day doing funerals and weddings, and uh, I like it. It's really my profession, boxing. I moonlight as a boxer. Mm -hmm. This must have come to you as a miracle. I mean, in a split second, you... you was yeah. saved by God. Yeah, because especially I didn't believe in religion. I thought maybe it was man-made and it was always seemed to be embraced by people who, was on, who were on a down and out. Mm -hmm. And I had a good life. I didn't see any reason to have religion in it. But after that uh, uh, experience, it changed my whole life. It made a better man for me to note for certain there was a real living God and Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I've, I've embraced it and loved it since. Mm -hmm. How do you go around saving souls? Well, the thing about it, I, I heard that the best sermon in the world is by example. Mm -hmm. And God is the one that saved them anyway. So I point to Jesus being the answer. And people see that answer and they pursue it if they love it. And in a time of need, if, they, if they've ever been reminded or pointed to the name, they'll find what I found, peace of mind. Have you seen other people that you have uh, talked about to God that they have been rescued or saved or, or whatever, or have a better life? Yeah, I find that anyone, no matter what condition you in or position you are, if you really find uh, some, uh, some uh, relationship with God, mm -hmm. you get peace of mind. And that's probably the best thing in the world to have because wealth exactly. and fame can't bring peace of mind. That's for certain. But everybody tries to, do, to get that. I do believe yeah. that wealth, especially, is uh, the answer to everything. Yeah. I tried it the first time around, and I had everything that a young man could ever dream of, mm -hmm. but I didn't have peace of mind. This time around, although I just got the title back too, but to have that peace of mind, it was probably the biggest title in the world, no, knowing that, that I know for a fact there's a living God. Uh, what is most important to you? Well, of course my walk, and my religious walk, and knowing Jesus Christ, but I have a family, I have nine kids, four boys, five daughters, that's very important to me. And I got a beautiful wife who I love to fight and argue with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why did you quit then in 1977? Well, when I had this experience about mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, I started to share it with the whole world. It was shocked me. I was amazed. I didn't know religion was real. And uh, for 10 years, all I did was told this story. I never intended to go back to boxing because I figured you know, in boxing, you got to be mean. You got to hate people. That's the only way I knew how to prepare for a boxing match. But uh, later on, after working then, with, then. Mm -hmm. but later on, after working with kids at a youth center, and I started teaching them how to box as a way of keeping them out of trouble and getting away bad tempers and things. I realized, hey, you can do this without anger. Mm -hmm. You can actually pursue boxing without a killer instinct. Mm -hmm. And I started teaching it to other people, selling the product. I start using it myself. Mm. That enabled me to get back into boxing. And now you are a role model, especially in that way. Yeah. I mean, that you don't have to be a bad guy or have a killing, killer instinct, whatever, to become yeah. a fighter. Yeah, all you need to do, there's never a punch for me in anger. Never. Mm. I love boxing. It's a wonder, wonderful profession. It's been around for ages. It will always be here. And... Uh, Surely you can get hurt in it, but not like a marriage. You can really get hurt in marriage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you had your experience. Yeah, so you can get hurt in anything. That's the point I'm trying to make. And just because you can get hurt in it doesn't mean it's any dangerous in anything else. Mm -hmm. Of course, boxing could be made safer. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see it reduced to a pie eating contest. <laughs> then I'd be a champion forever. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You said you've been hurt by your wife. Uh, yeah, I was say? married before. Okay. Uh, when you're married, on and off, like I've been married, you you uh, you 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 know you have a lot of disappointments. Mm -hmm. But of course, I'm wonderfully married now. I have a good wife. We've been married for over a decade. We got lots of beautiful kids. So I suggest that everybody have a wife. <laughs> every man, and every woman have a husband. There's nothing like it. So jump in the water is fine. <laughs> was there any particular person that was uh, very important to you when you become Christian? I mean. After 1977, Muhammad Ali had his Muslims that he had, uh, you know, one important person there. 
Was there any particular person that was important to you, or was it just God? Yeah, uh, Stephen, uh, when I found Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. I found a friend. And probably the most important thing in my life was God himself, because I was able to communicate on a personal basis, mm -hmm. prayer every day, and uh, it was only God. I was just overwhelmed. It just took, overtook my life. You still go in the, to church and preach, right? Yes. Uh, once on Sunday morning, mm -hmm. 10 o'clock service, Wednesday at 7 and Saturdays, mm -hmm. uh, I'm in church too, at 7 in the evening. I love church. That's what I love doing. When I was staying in Chicago, my, my training was a Baptist priest. I went to their church and they were singing a lot. And it was so overwhelming to be in the church. Do you sing in your, in your church? Oh, when you're in church, you got to sing. Mm -hmm. I play guitar. Yeah. Uh, I beat on the tambourine. I play the trombone, the trumpet. And mm -hmm. of course, you got to sing if you go to church. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shores, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. Oh, I go all along. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I good. love to sing, but nobody likes to hear me, though. But I love to sing. <laughs> That's good. Uh, go back again a little bit to 1973 when you become the heavyweight champion for the first time in your life, you were meeting Joe Fraser. I mean, uh, he was a terrible guy. <laughs> and uh, how did you go into that fight? It's strange because when you fight someone like Joe Frazier, he was so famous during the 70s. I'd seen him fight Muhammad Ali, Jimmy Ellis. And the thing about Frazier, if you hit him, he liked it. Mm -hmm. If you missed him, you only made him mad. And so I was really afraid of Joe Frazier. I had to stare him down. And when you happen to stare down someone like Frazier, you hope that you don't win the stare match because if he drops his he head, your knees are shaking. He's going to see them. <laughs> <laughs> I was really afraid of Joe Frazier. He was the first man that I was scared of in the ring. And probably why I knocked him down so much. I was scared he'd get up and get me back. You became the champion and um, received a lot of money, I guess. And uh, on top of the world, on the first time, without God again, and... Uh, you were buying all these things you could do for money. You had fame and fortune. How did you treat that time? Probably, when you get to be heavyweight champion of the world, and plus I'd come from an environment of being extremely poor, so I thought you could buy everything. And being champion of the world, people told me I would have everything, so I bought everything. Mm -hmm. But I could not buy happiness. <laughs> I tried. That's why you always looked like a, I mean, a sad person. Yeah. You never smiled before. No. Twenty years ago, you didn't yeah. used to smile. I kept looking for that something that would make me happy. I would buy, 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 but I never did achieve that. What I really was seeking after was being contented with, with life. I couldn't find it, so it makes you mad. <laughs> I see. Then come up to, of course, Muhammad Ali was always in the picture at that time, mm -hmm. and uh, was, he was hyping, trying to get a fight with you. Did it annoy you in some way? I mean, Muhammad Ali was, was a person that got a lot of attention. You, at your time, mm -hmm. at that time, you were a silent person. And therefore, Muhammad Ali got more, probably the most attention. And you mm -hmm. were the heavyweight champion. Yeah, it's an aggravating thing to be the best at what you do mm -hmm. and then still be under the shadow or somewhere in the shadow of the great Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. He was a showman. He put on the show. The show was so good, I'd even like it. <laughs> <laughs> He, he called himself the greatest. And let me tell you, when you were around Muhammad Ali, it was the greatest show on earth. The guy could put on the show, do the shuffle, crack jokes. And, but realistically, I, I figured if I could whip this guy, the shadow would fall. And then I would emerge as the, uh, as the, over, uh, as the overshadow myself. But it didn't happen like that. No. 1974 in uh, Kinshasa, Saida, you lost your heavy championship too. Muhammad Ali, and uh, we have also the, that fight to look at. Okay. 21 years, no, 20 years ago. More than 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Ali scores again with a light left hand, and that time a straight left bounces the head back of Foreman. A quick, short jab with the right hand bounces the head around. Well, the end of it, you'll see how the Foreman has eaten. We should follow him as to see what some chairs. Ali can also eat much of Foreman when he gets out of the ring. Foreman is a little bit now. Ali is now on the chance to win the fight. He sees that now is it now time for the fight to win the fight, or for the set from the end of the attack. He knows that if he waits for too long, he will get hit himself. 
Så du må se noe snart. Men jeg har jo sett honom nå da flere ganger. Ikke minst da fra den femte ronde som vi så tidligere. Og fra en forsøk. Nesten alle ronder derefter. Til det her angrepet med overhandsslag. Han går inn over George Tröttagard. Försöker pricka mot Torre. Det är rakt efter det. Ja, vi er mer aktiv nå enn han har vært i noen annen runde. Han er stadig frem på med sine små jabber. Vi ser at Ali er nå klar i blikket. Han begynner å sikte seg inn mot hva som skal bli kanskje historiens mest spesielle slagserie. Ändå kommer allt detta nu väldigt överraskande både för den stora publiken där och för hela tv-publiken över världen. Eh, han har då som vi ser när Sacklight hon drog ut honom i ringens mitt bara backat över till nästa ringsida och nästa ringhörn. Och nu är det står där och låter George putta på så att säga. Ja, formen är så trött nu att han klarar inte att slå slagen med krafter längre. Men han bara vevar iväg nu och det är nästan ingen kraft alls i dessa slag mot mellangärdet. Och Clayton försöker få ut dem i ringens mitt men Ali står kvar. Lutar sig bekvämt mot ruppen. Jag försöker nästan Clayton dra ut dem. Det är den första höjda som gick in. Ja, nu, nu kommer allt uppe. Häng med här nu. Och i golvet drösar väldige George Foreman. Räkningen på 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 och 10 ut. Han hinner inte upp. Ja, här får vi nu reprisen. Och George alltså går in mot honom och blir träffad av två saker som inte något riktigt tar. Men sen svänger han runt honom. Och så kommer allt ihop. Vänster uppkött och så en höjdkryss rätt på käven och store George Foreman faller över henne för första gången i sin karriär. And um, now you had lost your uh, title. How was that experience without the title? You had money I, that I think I read at that time you received 5 million dollars each. That was a lot of money 20 Lots years ago. Of money. And then you find yourself because you heavyweight champ of the world, and for me, that meant that I was the toughest man alive. Mm -hmm. And when I lost the title to Muhammad Ali, not only did I lose my title, I lost my manhood. For a long time, I didn't even feel like I was a man anymore, that everybody could see I was naked without my title. Mm -hmm. I was devastated by this match. I'd wake up in the night sweating and shaking. I couldn't get it. It took me a long time to overcome that. It was not until I found religion that I was able to overcome that defeat in my life. How did you live through that period in your life? I mean, you had money, but you had, didn't have fame anymore. And um, how did yeah, you live through that? Yeah, it was very aggravating because the hardest thing was not to the public, but to overcome what I felt about myself. I realized that I didn't give it all. I kept thinking, if you were going to lose, why didn't you just, just get killed? Why didn't you just die? Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't give it all. So I had to live under that, not giving 100% because why was I staggering around? Why was I waiting around? Why did I get tired? I kept asking myself these questions that were never answered. Did you do anything uh, that you regret now after that fight? I mean, did you do anything bad things? Well, uh, I lost all control of my life, moralistic. I didn't have anything to, uh, that I could put my hand on. I was not the guy that I would be proud of today. Drinking food around? No, never did drink or nothing mm -hmm. like that, but I was a mean guy. And I probably took out a lot of rage and disappointment on other people by hurting them, hurting their feelings. Mm -hmm. Very distrustful and very dangerous. Mm -hmm. I was so, as dangerous as a rattlesnake. <laughs> so you were, you were <laughs> not a good person to be around that No, time. not at all. I mean, Muhammad Ali was the great hero, of course. Of that. That's true. Tell the truth. I, not the truth. I tell you, uh, I think that Muhammad Ali by beating, uh, you know, he was not that popular be before that fight. I mean, he was because of this military thing in Vietnam, because of his uh, religion thing. And he didn't, uh, before, he, after he beat you, he became real popular at that time. That's true. 
and uh, that must have uh, affected you also. That's true. I mean, I figured that's why I had to come back. I said, figured I was going to get my title. Yeah. So I fought after Muhammad Ali a couple of more years trying to regain that title. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of hate for Muhammad Ali because I'd lost to him. Get back to your, as you said, you were uh, not a good person to be around at that time. I don't know if this brings us over to this thing I want to talk about, whatever. I will talk about it because in the, right now in this time we have uh, also a hero in America, O.J. Simpson. That is a great hero, athlete hero in, in America, are up for a big trial. How are your feelings about that? Well, I met O.J. Simpson back in 1968, and he was already a Heisman Trophy and a celebrity. And he was the nicest young man I'd ever met in my life. And I'd see him from time to time. He was never consumed with being a celebrity. The nicest guy ever. And I could never believe that O.J. Simpson could hurt someone to the extent that he's been accused of doing. I just don't believe that. Uh, but he's not a good role model right now. If, if well, when you go to jail, part of life for everybody to understand that life is not always going to be up. Mm -hmm. There are some downs that go with life, too. And O.J. Simpson is having a rough time right now. But a lot of us are hoping that he overcomes. Mm -hmm. Of course, he's been associated with an awful tragedy. Mm -hmm. Some people have lost their lives. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of grieving that will go along because it happened in the world. So it will even affect you, Stephan, and what you do every day because you're looked at as an athlete. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to talk. You have uh, had some uh, views on another athlete. Of course, he is convicted now, so we, we won't talk about that. I'll talk about Mike Tyson. But you said some nice things about that, about him. I mean, f I, it's hard for a young guy to get into jail. He had a lot of fame and fortune. He had many of the same problems as you. Have you, you have explained that before, George, about these feelings about Mike Tyson and what he experienced? Yeah, I think that Mike Tyson was more a victim of uh, the times than anything else. He was wealthy and not having a whole lot of supervision. He, was he got into a lot of trouble. And he found that money cannot get you out of all troubles either. <laughs> sometimes if you are accused of things, whether you're right or wrong, sometimes you can be in the wrong places at the wrong time and you can get yourself into trouble. And, uh, but w life is funny and the country is funny. I'm sure he'll be given a second chance. Mm -hmm. It's up to him to take advantage of it. Do you think he's having a hard time in jail? Oh, no doubt about it. Your freedom is probably the most splendid thing that you've got, your freedom mm -hmm. to be able to get up at night and go to your, your refrigerator and get something, a soda pop. Mm -hmm. Then go down to the street and buy a cheeseburger. When someone take that from you, you're going to have a rough time with life. Will you give him some, some advice when he gets out? Yeah, I'd like to meet Mike Tyson and let him know that, hey, the past is done. Don't live in the past. Reach for the stars. Life can be better in the future if you just forget about the past. And that's what he's going to have to be convinced of. And of course, i got to let him know that Jesus is the way. <laughs> vi skal uh, snakke mer med George Foreman, men uh, rett etter dette så får vi også en ny gjest inn, nemlig Brian Nilsen, som var da påtenkt til å møte George Foreman i hans neste kamp. Vi kommer tilbake, og vi skal uh, prate mer med George Foreman, men vi har også fått en tredje person inn i uh, rommet her, som uh, Brian Nilsen, vår danske tomhøysbokser, profesjonelle, som er inne på rankinglistene nå, som uh, kanskje skal få en VM-sjans etter hvert. And, uh, George, vi har jo hatt big fellow her, Brian Nilsen fra Danmark. He looks a little bit mean right now, but he's, yeah. he's, he's coming around. <laughs> 
there have been some uh, talk about. I know that there were three fighters that were suggested for you to fight now. Axel Schulz, Lou Savarez, was it? Uh -huh. And Brian Nielsen from Denmark. Were you ever in the, the talk about, or uh, did you consider Brian Nielsen? Well, they gave me the names, but I had seen uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the guy in uh, mm -hmm. America. I can't think of his name. You said it before. Oh, Luis Arez. Sebris. Yeah. So I'd seen him. Then they showed me a film of the other guy, and we never did get a chance to watch him. Thank mm -hmm. God. I'm glad <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> no, but you know, uh, you have said on and off. Sometimes you want to have another fight after Axel Schulz. Yes. Uh, we don't know it. You said also that you might retire. And of course, you don't know what happened after the fight. So, but I mean, yeah, if, he, if, the, if he stays and uh, if he has some more fights and doesn't get defeated, then maybe we could come abroad and uh, we can box him. Maybe in Germany, huh? Maybe, or in Denmark. Oh, really? He's from Denmark. I would oh. like him to fight in Denmark. You know, he. he I thought was, they didn't allow boxing. In Denmark, they did. Oh, but they not, did. not in Sweden and Norway. Oh, okay. Denmark, we'll come, we'll oh. fight. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, he, he, um, he just half a year ago he beat uh, Bone Crusher Smith. Uh huh. So that makes so, him, uh, so that's great. So maybe we can come over in a box. But he's got a promise. Remember, I'm too old. You can't hurt me. But you know, <laughs> I know that Brian, you have picked up something from from George. His style wise. I mean, you have said George that if I miss him with the left, yeah, and I miss him with the right. A belly bump him. That's true. So that, that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Brian can do that. That's your major protection, the belly bump. Right. Brian, do you have any thoughts about fighting, I mean, a big hit like, like George Foreman? No. I, really, I hope I can sing a fight with George. I'll box. It's a date. It's a date. It's we'll a box. Date. We'll box. Yeah. How much do you weigh in and pounds? Oh. No, I changed my mind. <laughs> uh, well, uh, a lot too, a lot. Yeah, but we'll we'll make a date after uh, the fight with uh, uh, Axel. Then we'll come over and we'll box him. Mm -hmm. How's that? What are you gonna do with all the money we're gonna make, huh? <laughs> we're gonna fight. It's gonna He'd be a tough retire, fight. Then. It's going to be a tough fight. Are you not afraid of, of uh, George? Do you think he's too old? Or? No, he's an old man. man. <laughs> he's a strong man. I know he's strong. Man. I think I'm um, more faster than him. Faster? Yeah. You think we knock him out? Or? Uh, I don't think I do. <laughs> <laughs> I think bad <laughs> man, Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> Stefan's <is> bad <laughs> man, bad man. <laughs> I remember, you know. How would go sell? <laughs> I remember, um, because I know that you have, af also after your comeback, you have been being nice to some fighters. I've seen you have the referee come in, stop the fight, I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, it got me into a lot of trouble, yeah. especially because uh, the guy, uh, Alex Stewart from yeah. New York, yeah. I knocked him down once, knocked him down again, I was hitting him a lot, and I asked the referee, hey, stop, I don't want to hurt him. Mm -hmm. So I eased up on him and he started beating me around. I left that fight looking like I didn't know what. I remember. I mean, I was bleeding like a yeah. pig mm. because I was taking it easy. So I don't take it easy anymore. Mm. No, uh, but you even took it easy sometimes before. In your um, 12th fight, uh, you fought a guy named Levi Forte. You remember Yeah, him? way back. Yeah. 1969, I believe yeah, it was. That's true. And he was the first one that went the distance. Exactly. That's what I'm coming I at. I could not get him. <laughs> he was no? smart. Yeah, that's one thing. But I, you remember, I, I went back. I went to Florida in 1980 to become a professional fighter, and I was sparring down in Fifth Street gym. And there was a guy named Levi Forte. He sparred, and he, of course, he talked about his fight with you. Uh -huh. And he told me that um, you went, you went the distance with George at that time. Yes. You know what I did? I whispered into his ear. Please, George, don't knock me out. <laughs> is, that, is that true? No, I just couldn't get him. He <laughs> told me that. No, he was very smart. <laughs> right. Very smart. And maybe he convinced you that way. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He was intelligent. Yeah. So uh, that is a possibility for you, Brian. Whisper into his ears. Please don't <laughs> knock me out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then you can say, I won't knock you out. He can't knock me out. <laughs> no. 
No, no, I think, I think no people can do that. Maybe no. one day, maybe not. I don't think God can do it. Peace. <laughs> there will be peace in the valley for me. <laughs> yeah. But he's, he's a tough, he, he can really take a punch. Yeah. I hope he can. Okay. I hope so it's a date. It's a it's date. A date. Okay. okay. We will announce that a little later, but okay. it, it's a date, right? It's a date. <laughs> uh, we have to pursue with your uh, career. And uh, why did you come back? Well, initially, uh, I, I laid out of boxing for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I had enough money to last for a long time, but then I got interested in charity. My brother Roy and me started a George Foreman Youth Center mm -hmm. where we tried to help the kids. And I didn't have enough money to do it. And I had a choice of allowing myself to forget about the kids and take, off, take care of my personal family or to get money. And I started asking people for money. They thought I was begging for money. Mm -hmm. For myself, I got embarrassed. So finally I decided I'm going to be heavyweight champ of the world again. I know how to get money mm -hmm. for my youth center. That was the original reason for my coming back to boxing. And it worked out just fine. It did. It, it certainly did. did. And uh, you still, um, I mean, that is a big engagement for you still to, to yeah, you, build you, up youth. Center. Yeah, the youth center is very important, but we've got it established now, and I don't need to f fight for it yeah. that much anymore. But I like to stay active. There are a lot of charities, and I get out there, and I love boxing anyway. I lose sometimes, but I like it. Gary Cooney was a turning point for in your comeback career, right? Yeah, Jerry Cooney, the hardest left hook right. in the business. I thought not. I thought it was a lot of just put on. Maybe they were just powder puffing me with this guy. Mm -hmm. But in the ring, I charged him, and he hit me with a left hook, and it hurt me, mm -hmm. just like with Ronnie Lyles. And uh, he allowed me to recover the next round. He didn't know I was hurt. And we got toe-to-toe, -to -toe and I was able to get rid of him. Mm -hmm. But that was the hardest I'd been hit since Ronnie Lyles back in 1976. And then after that, I mean, they start talking about uh, title fight, because then you prove that this is for real. This is not uh, talk or just hype. This is for real. I mean, uh, then they came come the fight with um, Holyfield in '91, uh, I believe it was, yes, yes. and uh, you went 12 rounds with Holyfield That's close. True. And that time you start talking about this is a new, uh, what do you say, new born thing for the elderly people. That's true. I wanted to prove not only that I could uh, get out there and become champ of the world, I probably got too involved, not just becoming champ of the world, but I wanted to show the world that the age 40 wasn't a death sentence. So I went to 12 rounds. I stood up every round. A lot of times I had him hurt. I didn't finish him out. Of course, he would come back and throw lots of punches. But at no time was I in trouble. But in a few times, he was in trouble. And the world knew for a fact then that, hey, athletes are not dead at 40. I proved that, and I was happy about that. I think a lot of other athletes were happy about it, that too. Yeah. And then come uh, uh, Tommy Morrison, uh, 93, in, in the summer. And um, were you good enough prepared for that fight? Did oh. he, was he able to trick you out? Well, with Tommy Morrison, it was a very unusual fight. For the first time, I was going to be up for a WBO title. I was happy about that. And I, started, I had him just in trouble, but I let him off a hook again, thinking, well, I got the fight won. Mm -hmm. Why knock him out? I was shocked when they gave him that decision. Mm -hmm. Shocked out of my shoes. Because I heard in the corner that uh, John D said that you're okay, you're okay. Yeah. And you believe that you were ahead on points. Yeah, I, I really thought I was ahead on points, but after the fight was over, I was shocked. Mm -hmm. But not discouraged. Mm -hmm. You said it was okay. I mean. Yeah, I'll, I'll have another chance. I was still young. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he used that uh, Jesse De Walcott walk around you. Yeah. It was smart. Yeah, he was smart. He fought a good fight, intelligent fight. So then, uh, of course, became the, the champ now in November. And uh, what will you do after Axel Schultz, after Brian Nielsen? Is it to, it's talk about uh, Mike Tyson. Yeah, I'll give Mike Tyson a year to get back out. And if he really wants to ch get himself in shape, if he wants to challenge for the title, I'll give him a chance. But if he's not out in a year, it'll be the last of George Foreman. I'll go into uh, to do something else. I hate to use the word retire because I'm too young for that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I'll do something else. I just can't stay a kid forever. I got to do something rough like mm -hmm. ping pong or tennis. But, <laughs> but you already made history, George. I mean, mm -hmm. why? Uh, of course, you will run money for your youth mm -hmm. center and things like that. But you, you are you are so great now. 
Why? Why? What? Well, you people going? say that you're great, but that's something that people say. Mm -hmm. Inside, I'm still a guy striving to to achieve things. I've never lost that. I never say, "Boy, you are you're there." Mm -hmm. That's for someone else to say. Uh, there's an old saying in the Bible: "Is let someone else praise you, not yourself." And I don't think I've achieved that much yet. I've got a lot to go. You think you have your title in this time? Uh, uh, yes, because I got to fight you for it. You gonna fight for the heavyweight title? You don't right. have the title after me. No, you gonna fight for the title. You and me. Yeah. But you won't have it after him, you said. I mean, I mean, I mean, you win the next fight, three, four fights. Yeah, I, no, I'm gonna win that first title. Then I'm gonna fight you, and then we're gonna fight and make the best man win. The belt won't fit around your waist either. <laughs> <laughs> then it's my time to make a comeback. <laughs> I have to put it on our shoulder. <laughs> so it's uh, good uh, things in the future. I would like to also, we're getting close to the end now, George, and uh, uh, you are, besides being a father, you are a preacher, you have a man of great visions for the future. And now we're getting into uh, philosophical questions here. Um, there is a lot of problems in, on our earth, and um, do you see any any hope for our mother earth? Oh, a lot of for hope. humanity? My winning the heavyweight championship of the world, number one, proves that the planet is in good shape. Mm -hmm. That mankind, as we go into the 21st century, is going to be healthy, because I'm the standard bearer. And secondly, that uh, the things I say are going to be universally talked about. So I think as the century changes, you're going to see a lot of peace in the world. A lot of the wars are going to come to an end. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see a lot of fellowship in whatever nation. I think when the, when the century changes, you're going to see that. Mm -hmm. It's happening now, although you don't notice it, but it's happening. It's a good world, good planet. I don't want to die and leave it. No. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, there have to be a lot of healthy people up there. Well, that's true. To be able to... God is right yeah, there. Yeah, there, there are a lot of people and there are a lot of uh, good politicians mm -hmm. coming on the scene. As a matter of fact, Stefan, uh, we don't expect to see you in boxing anymore. We see you moving into the uh, <laughs> the limelight. Hopefully, you'll be a world leader one day. Uh, <laughs> but that was finally going to be my question. I mean, I'm not, I'm, now I'm not joking. Uh, because you have been so good role model and you have set so many good goals for yourself, and you've proven that everything is possible, and you are living in a country where everything is possible. It has been proven to many other people than you. Uh, why is it, I mean, that would be a great goal for you, to be, go into politics, maybe with the president. Well, there are a lot of problems to be solved in the world. Not necessarily they, they're going to be solved by politicians. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of humanitarians who really set the stage. And uh, I'm, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to take you into politics. I'm going to be your handyman. <laughs> Stephen, Stephen, <laughs> go, Stephen. <laughs> I'm going to follow you. But there are a lot of problems that are going to be solved within the next year. And the world, as we go into the 21st century, is going to be a lot better. Take my word. Yeah. I feel comfortable when you're saying that. Because yeah, I it's going to be be better. I believe, that everything you, I believe everything you say. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, I'm glad that you are very positive regarding... Um, the future. Do you have some final words to, to not to bless us, but, but to say something for, for the future? What, what's well, I, the future looks good for me, and I, was, I had a chance to travel, and when I started making my entry into the Scandinavian countries, looking over at the beauty of it, I realized that I really have accomplished a lot. And to land here as heavyweight champ of the world has been a splendid achievement for me. It's proof now that anybody can. Any man, any boy can, and any woman can. Do what they want to do. Do what they want to do. If you want to dream, when you wish upon a star, it makes no difference who you are. Anything your heart desires can come to you. Thank you, George. Thank you. Det har varit en samtal med George Foreman. Tack för det. Hi, this is Travis.